Take your Bible, if you will, and I want you to open up to Ephesians chapter 4 as we continue this series called Constructing Community, Total Body Function. And Ephesians 4 is our, is our foundational passage. It's the verse that we're kind of building everything on, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. It is the one that, uh, that, that the Lord led me to in starting this uh, series that sort of lets us know if we will be engaged in total body function, then we will experience what he promises us in this passage. It's Ephesians chapter 4. Let's stand together and, and read it uh, uh, as it comes on the screen here. He is the one who gave these gifts to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full-grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. Then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. Instead, we will hold to the truth in love, becoming more and more in every way like Christ, who is the head of His body, the church. Under His direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Lord, add Your blessing to Your Word today. May Your Spirit, God, bring it and just drive it into our hearts that we might fully know and fully follow that which you've given us in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As each part does its own special work, that's what, uh, what Paul said. As we look through the, the letters from the apostles, the epistles, as we consider the New Testament, as we consider the instructions that were given to us, we focus in during this series on several of the one another's because they appear all throughout these mutual responsibilities that we have for each other, how we're to relate to each other. And, and those things are given to us because he says, if we'll do them, if we'll fulfill them, we will grow. Not just in number, which would be great because it would show the expansion of the kingdom, but also as mature believers, having been solidified in the foundation that Christ gave us in his uh, blood. Last week we began to look at, at one of the most important, in fact I consider it, the foundational, the bottom line as a believer, and that's love. We looked at it in terms of Christ's command. He gave us this. He said, I'm giving you a new command, that you love one another as I have loved you, so you also love one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples, by the love that you have for one another. He established that with us, and he gave it to us to show us the priority and significance that he was going to place on it. It's interesting, John records it, and then later on in the letters that he writes, he says it over and over again, how we're to love one another. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, he says, Beloved, brothers, sisters, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. The one that does not love does not know God, for God is love, so let us love one another. He, re he reminds us over and over and over again. And last week we looked at, at the command. But this week what I want us to examine is I want us to see what it really is. What that Christ love, what that agape love really looks like. We're going to dissect it. We're going to look at it. We're going to seek to understand it. We're going to try to understand it as Keith Miller in his book, The Sense of Love, understood it. That's a book that came out many, many, many years ago, and, and uh, I read it back when it first came out, and I've pulled it off and, and scanned through it again. And his premise is this, that, that the love that we have for one another can, 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 can be a sense, can, can make a difference. How many of you smell pretty good? I don't mean you smell pretty good. I mean you, your, your olfactory senses are, are acute. Okay? I about just stepped right into, off the, off the, off the, into the abyss right then. You know... I love that I can smell things. For example, how many of you have gone outside here lately and one of your neighbors somewhere is grilling? Isn't there is no smell like that? <laughs> uh, you walk outside, we had pasta salad one night, walked outside, someone, someone was grilling a cow. <laughs> I mean, it's great. Do you know that in the Old Testament, as it talks about the sacrifices, it, as it talks about the burnt offerings, do you know how it's referred many times? as a pleasing aroma 
to God. Well, I thought, man, wrap your mind around that for a minute. That what we would offer God would be a pleasing aroma, a fragrant offering to him. Contrast that to Jonah. In the beginning of Jonah, the, the, the word of God comes to Jonah. I want you to go and preach to Nineveh. And almost literally what God is saying is their sin stinks to highest heaven. That, that the scent, the aroma, the smell of, of wrong would, would be a stench. And yet the smell of what is offered in, in love and in purity could be a fragrant offering, a pleasing aroma. And, and, and we look at the church in its earliest form, as, as they were talking about in Acts chapter 2, that the church was in unity, they were in one accord, they were joined together, and they were having an impact around them. That in Acts chapter 4, it talks about how they, how they gathered together frequently, regularly. They were meeting the needs of other believers as they had needs. They were, they were having their meals together. They were sharing in those moments together. And I just believe that that became a fragrant offering, a, a scent that really had an impact in the atmosphere, much better than walking outside and smelling somebody grilling. And so the sense of love, what, what does it look like? What is it? Well, we're going to look today at a passage that you've probably heard. If you've been to any weddings at all, you've probably heard it at the weddings. You've probably heard it preached before. You've probably heard it taught before. If nothing else, you've heard it in, uh, in poetry books and so on. And it's called the love chapter. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want you to flip over there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to look at the whole thing because what I want us to see today, last week we looked at the command, today I want us to see the contents, if you will, of what this Christ love, what this agape love really is. And, and, and whereas last week we looked at how we were, God, Christ demands that of us, now we're going to see how we're able to measure. Remember last week, if you were here, I, I asked you at the end, I said, I said, how does your love meter read? What, you know, are you empty? Are you full? Are you kind of in between? Well, this gives us a real clear measure of how we can measure that love meter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you find that in your Bible, I want you to move back one verse to the last verse of chapter 12. Because we're going to look at it in the context of what Paul is writing about. All of chapter 12, Paul has been dealing with them over the spiritual gifts, the, the charismata uh, of the church. And what was going on in Corinth was they were taking these gifts and they were abusing them. and They were, they were using them in improper ways. And so Paul is trying to help them sort through all of these things, the, the tongues, the prophecy, the, all of the, the, the things, because, see, they liked them. It was kind of a way of garnering the spotlight, if you will. If you spoke in, in tongues, people paid attention to you. If you prophesied, people paid attention to you. They may not have any idea what you were saying, but they paid attention to you. And Paul was saying, listen, you can't do this if it's bringing disruption into the body. And then he comes down to this, and here's what he says. He says in, in verse 31, And in any event, you should desire the most helpful gifts. First, however, let me tell you about something else that is better than any of them. It's as though Paul is saying this, listen, before you concern yourself, before you worry about getting this gift or that gift or, or this gift or this thing or that thing, first, get the best thing. Get the most excellent. And he's going to spend a whole chapter on one gift, the gift of love. Look at, look at it. It's if I, and he starts it out with this. If I could speak in any language, if I, could, if I had the gift of tongues in heaven or on earth, but I didn't love others, I would only be making meaningless noise, like a loud gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I knew all the mysteries of the future, and knew everything about everything, but didn't love others, what good would I be? And if I had the gift of faith, so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, without love, I would be no good to anyone. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and even sacrificed my body. I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would be of no value whatsoever. You see, as we look at this in the context, we understand first, Paul is placing love in first place. This is the first place of love. Above all of the others, as, as the foundation really of every other gift, is, was the gift of love. Um, I remember, I hadn't been in ministry very long, and uh, and I, I'll be honest.